Just a friendly reminder that the opinions expressed on this show are not worth a Canadian penny, so disregard anything you hear that might get anyone in trouble. And despite some of the great ideas you may hear, don't try them at home. Go to friend's house instead. It's time to get a gun. That's what I've been thinking. Well, I could afford one. And if I did just a little less drinking, time to put something between me and the sun. Everybody, welcome to Slam Fry Rip. Ep- yeah. Hey, everybody, welcome to Slam Fry Radio, episode 399. I'm just going forward for April 8th, 2021. I'm one of your hosts, Kelly. I'm one, Adriel. And I am random interfering with Kelly Dave. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Great job at it. Hey, Dave's here. It's, it's great to what I do. see you, Dave. We've missed you. Thank you. Brian Bolivar actually posted, oh. a, uh, posted a thing on Facebook, which was post the first fa- photo of something that makes you happy. And I thought of my photo of all of us in Alberta. And I'm like, you know what? That makes me happy. I need, okay, to, I seri- need to come more. Yeah, seriously. That's one of my f- most favorite get togethers of us, all of yeah. us. Agreed. That was an amazing week. 20 of us in the Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> glad the host, and glad the guy who owned the building didn't come by. And, you know. He did, actually. Made oh, did he? Before. Yeah. Anyways. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway. And then we went and climbed the hoodoos. It was fun. We did. We climbed. I, got, I, climbed. I still have my rocks. They're actually, uh, I moved them. I do. I stole rocks from Alberta, you know, steal your natural resources. I don't know where they are right now, but I have rocks from the top of that. The rest, the rest of the country the of. Uh, usually steals our natural resources or at least yeah. the money from it. Yeah. I'm from Ontario. I'm just stealing your stuff. So, mm, you know, not that much, do. not that much. You guys are mostly <laughs> self-sufficient. That's true. All right. Let's get into what we did in guns this week. Uh, what we did in guns this week is brought to you by the Calgary Shooting Center is Canada's premier firearm retailer. Right now they got the Benelli M1, uh, MR1, sorry, not M1. Duh. MR1. Uh, it's like yeah, a 223 MR1. thing. It's, yeah, it's 223. Uh, let's see. So, so hideous. Do you want to bring it up? It is a little hid, but it's also. It's non restricted and yeah. it's uh, available. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Mm-hmm. And they work well. I know a few people that have them. They seem to be very fussy about ammunition, but once you get them dialed in, they seem to be pretty good. All right. And they'll yeah. run the two two three, which is a little cheaper, and also they're twenty three hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Yep. So go over Not to bad. the Calgary Shooting Center. Say hi to Jeff for me, or us. And or they us. only have three left in stock, so you better get on that. Yeah, they get out. Not have that many for long. Nope. So <clears throat> since Dave is joining us for the first time in a long time, Dave, what have you done in guns for ever? <laughs> <laughs> Not a whole lot because I've been able to get out to the ranges, but uh, I did I did find a used BX trigger set up for my 1022. So I'm slowly building my uh, my uh, Gray Birch 1022. It's all put together, but I cannibalized my ten, my uh, stainless steel 1022. So it's yeah. kind of weird. So yeah. I'm slowly finding parts and then adding it to it. So I got a BX trigger for it. So I'm going to see how that runs. Sweet. And awesome. I ordered uh, six six pack of magazines so i now have a crap ton of 1022 magazines so next maple seed unless i shoot it with my uh tavor i'm just gonna Mm. i'm just gonna yeah i'm gonna shoot it with my tavor but yeah you're gonna you're gonna shoot it with the tavor totally Mm -hmm. shoot it with the tavor totally yeah uh i but i may bring i'll bring the 1020 fruit back up in case somebody else needs it because it's the only time 20 magazines do shoot it so why not that's true. And another decision <laughs> I made is that I need to find some, there's a few places of, uh, sort of out here where I can actually, so I'm not friends with any farmers out here at the moment. I need to find a place I can just go shoot my non-restricted. Yeah. So I'm going to yeah. uh, find a place of provincial park that's labeled for hunting and uh, find a spot. I can go out a couple times a week and just blink. Mm-hmm. What about driving even just a little bit more north of you, Crown Land? <laughs> North of yeah. me is is Lake. So well, I know, but it, okay. Go out into the lake. Oh. <laughs> is that international waters? If I'm a couple yeah. miles offshore in Georgian Bay, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> just do what I want. Set up buoys and shoot at those. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, I gotta, I gotta look around and see what's around to shoot, um, and get out and shoot. There's a gun club up at Meaford. A buddy of mine invited me to a, a match in May, which I may or may not go to, but I may join up there because that's closer to me than my other clubs. And... Yeah, I was. It is pretty close to you. You should go and join. Yeah, I think yeah. I might. I know a few people up there, and they seem like a good bunch. They're starting to do. Uh, they're half decent more action people. shooting. Stuff. I know some people there too. Yeah, yeah they seem. They're, right. they're good people. Yeah, Terry and Greg. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Anyways. they seem all right. So yeah. they may join up there. We'll we'll see. But I'm keeping pretty close to home and not doing a whole lot right now. I think we all are, especially since yeah. there's a stay at home order. <laughs> not really <sighs> laughing at that. Yeah, I'm just so much saying. so much traffic out there today. <laughs> I think people are just sick of it. They're just like f you. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Your car anyway. could be your home. True. It could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or you could be at work or exercise or any of the other billion excuses. And the cops aren't doing anything about it one way or another. So. Traveling to get groceries. Yeah. In menacing. Or Ottawa. Well, well it does talk. It, anyways, why are we talking about the stay-at-home order? I don't know. Okay. You brought it up. I know. I was stupid. Damn. Why are we okay. doing it, says the host, when I'm the one who brought it up. <laughs> anyway. All right. What have you been? Uh, what have you been doing, Kelly? I I've been actually at home for the past couple of weeks, and one of the things that I have been doing is means I can concentrate more on Project Maple Seed. So we were able to release some events, and we're going to be releasing some more tonight as well. Nice. And uh, the other thing that I, we've been doing is uh, getting uh, the CCFR Gunny Girl calendar. We're doing plans for that, and we've Woo-hoo. done the call out for that. And oh, by the way, deadline. Everybody's asking about the deadline. So the deadline for the CCFR Gunny Girl cal- calendar call out is April 30th. You can send me a message here uh, at Slamfire, or you can do it through my personal page, or you can send us an email at slamfireradio@gmail.com if you want some information on that, or you can actually go to the CCFR website not website, uh, Facebook page. All the information is on there too, or on my Facebook page. And so if you want to participate in it, or if you know somebody who wants to participate in it. Uh, I want to participate in it. Yeah, Dave. No, I've seen you in your underwear. At, remember? At, <laughs> so at I've the, already done my tryout. The, 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 the best time ever when 20 people were, st- you know, at the Airbnb in Alberta. Just don't. Yeah. I have Walk. no shame. I walked into a room. Oh, there's David in his underwear. Walk <laughs> Hi, Kelly. <laughs> I'd been, you know what? I'd been standing there for like half an hour waiting for you to just walk in. So <laughs> you, you got to be quicker. <laughs> See anything you like? <laughs> Wink. <laughs> and it turned out the answer was no. And she stopped out. So yeah. well, yeah. very disappointing. Immediately out. That's what oh she my said. And, Trevor, and Trevor did the same thing. So I just mm. have a no. Walk in on you? Okay. Lock. Very disappointing. All right. <laughs> wow. You were trolling. Okay. Uh, the other thing that also happened, it, it happened last night. Finally heard from the person that's doing the Black Badge course for FRPC, which is the my local range. Anyways, so I got an email from it a lot last night, and he's just basically confirmed, sent all the information for it, all the study material, et cetera, et cetera. Nice. So, maybe get I'll your lipstick on. Get your lipstick on. Yeah, the black badge course. So cool. I'm officially in. Yeah, baby. Nice, nice. So, so that's that. And yeah, that's about it. So, <clears throat> Adriel, what about you? Oh, one thing that I have been doing. I told Adriel about this, by the way. I can't sleep at night, so I've been putting on Adriel's videos and watching those. <laughs> <laughs> He's been putting me to sleep. Oh. <laughs> A not very really. soothing voice and <laughs> yes. not boring, but actually. soothing. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I haven't I haven't watched the last few. Have the kids been editing more? Because you're one your kids edited yeah. however they wanted was freaking awesome. Uh, the was next, that was next one that's coming video. out is Sonic. Oh goodness. Nice. I'm gonna have to watch that. Nice. Okay. So Adriel, what have you been doing? Uh, you've been putting out some videos because I've been watching them. I've been putting out some videos. Um, I have uh, got a couple things in. Well, okay, let's start with the next the weekend. Okay. Uh, we had a construction day at Chaz, so we've built a bunch of props and fixed some stuff for our three gun matches. Uh, that went well. Uh, built a whole bunch more dump sleds, which is kind of like your staging table for your guns or whatever. Uh, and then some walls and I don't know, repaired a bunch of stuff and yada yada yada. Uh, after that. 
I went and shot the FX9, uh, and I wanted to get more footage of it shooting. Um, as well, I wanted to check what kind of speeds I got out of it, depending on on the different kind of uh, round that I shot out of it. Uh, so I tried some like 147, some 124, some 115. Oh, last time I had it out, it was just a piece Garbage. of crap. Oh, just terrible. So yeah. I did this little mod where I, like shave this piece of the bolt face, which you don't need to do <laughs> on the new ones. The old ones you do though. Uh, uh, and I oiled the heck out of it and it did run better. I still got the old, uh, a couple like death jam where, you know, what the case didn't quite eject and it went forward and so did the other one. And it, they both tried to get into the chamber at the same time. Mm. Um, still got a couple of those with brass case. And then I ran out of my brass case stuff. And I'm like, oh, I'll run the aluminum case stuff. How, how bad could it be? And uh, the answer is, uh, <laughs> uh, well, it could be. Uh, so that little guy got left behind uh, on one round. And then oh. the next one went in and I'm, and I'm like, looks chambered. Didn't feel right. Uh, Did it not feel right? Though it's kind of that. Mm, I, I might have pulled my my one hand like behind the action to fire it off, <laughs> and something was wrong. Yeah, so it wasn't fully chambered, uh, and because the FX9 allows access to the firing pin, even if it's not fully chambered, uh, you can get one of these. This is a case from an out of battery detonation, uh, which sounds really bad, but in real life, it's wasn't that bad sprayed some shit out the side um the worst thing it did was leave a bullet in the barrel which i then had to take home because i didn't have like you need a brass rod for that kind of thing to knock one of those guys out which i have at home but not at the range so i had to do that um and i think like i I talked with trevor and uh, he was saying that uh he had the same thing which is this case failure but with brass with a brass case So I think what that means, like I I was taking a look at the different components inside that FX9. I think the bolt is too light. So like there's there's two problems here. One, it allows uh, the firing pin to be accessed out of battery, uh, which is a design flaw. It shouldn't allow that. Um, But the other thing it does, I think the bolt is just too light. And with a straight blowback action, the weight of your bolt needs to like be enough to hold that case in place until the pressure is lower so that the case can start coming out. And if you don't do that, what happens is it's still grabbing on that front really tight because there's lots of pressure in there. And the, it's also ripping it backwards and it rips. And it splits. It splits yeah. the case in half. So I think that's why they say don't use aluminum in it because it's too violent of an action to uh, to allow for, for aluminum case usage. Uh, but really the fix is use a heavier you could change your buffer i guess you could change your buffer weight to to something a little bit heavier um maybe they don't because of the i'm just guessing a lot lot of this stuff but maybe they don't because of the uh the recoil spring they just want to use a standard ar recoil spring right so lots of guessing but uh long story short don't use aluminum cases in that thing and i still got jams even with the brass cases i'm thinking that maybe the answer is i buy a better gun some people are, have really good luck with them. Better. Some people have really good luck with them. I have not had very good luck with this one, um, and I, I I can't say I would recommend it um, over like some of the other PCCs that are out there. Like the Ruger PCC is um, not quite as ergonomic and like go fast as the FX9, but it would never have these kinds of issues. Like Ruger would never stand for that kind of crap in uh, in their guns. So. I've shot a few of those. They were ugly, but they really worked well. Yeah. Yeah, they're ugly. And okay. and like the the usability of it isn't like fantastic, yeah. but it runs. It runs and it's uh, they're fairly lightweight until you get the AR. Anyways, that's Ruger PC9. I uh, shot the SKSs. Uh, the thing I wanted to find out, is there a point in putting an, a scope on an SKS? Mm-hmm. So I have... Um, I really SKS. enjoyed that video. I haven't put that one out yet. I put out the tech site one. I put a tech site. I'm working on another one. Working on another one. Oh, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I did another one Uh, because I wanted to see, okay, tech site, fantastic. A little bit more accurate than than your standard rear end site. Makes a little bit of a difference on the SKS just because like the site radius and and the way that the original sites are. Um, But SKSs aren't very accurate Uh, to begin with. uh, You're shooting steel case surplus out. So what's it what's it look like when you put I put a six to 24 scope on one of them and Mm -hmm. the other one got tech sites. 
you'd no, be real different. hard pressed to tell the difference between the two uh, of them. Okay. Really hard pressed. And it's just because like SKSs are not that great and yeah. the rounds aren't that great. Uh, most of them are like three to five M away. So whether you're one M away with that scope or like a half M away with the scope or whether you're, you know, one and a half or two with the iron sights, it's doesn't really make a difference. Mm-hmm. Doesn't really make a difference. Uh, and that SKS, I, I tried a bunch of different ammo types. I tried like corrosive, non-corrosive, commercial, meh, meh. <laughs> They're all kind of bad. All the same. <laughs> They're all kind of bad. It's an SKS. It was really frustrating using a scope cranked up to like, you know, 24X and like squeezing that shot off and be like, boop. You mother! <laughs> <laughs> I put you right there. You should be there, not over here. Oh, and then I, I, I was doing ten round groups, and as the barrels heated up on the SKS fifteen, it would start veering right like about six inches as it started heating <laughs> up <laughs> over those ten rounds. Uh, you should go back to Simonov and complain about his hundred and fifty dollar cheapy battle rifle and how crappy it is. <laughs> At what, when did this thing came out? It wasn't a cheapy battle rifle, no, but. That's uh, true. Yeah, anyways, so uh, it's an S chaos, yeah, yeah. Long story short, it's, yeah, we know. Uh, just use the irons and uh, yeah. and and I wouldn't bother with a scope on it unless unless your eyes are bad. If your eyes are bad, then you got to go to a scope or a red dot or something like that. What sort of mount did you use? Uh, it is integral to the SKS 15, it's like built into the whole shebang because it's it built a onto the dust cover. No, no, oh, oh, it's the one where it comes up and over it. It re- no, it it replaces the whole thing. So you oh. stick your barreled action into this chassis. It secures oh. on the rear receiver pin and on the front. I'll send you a picture of it stripped yes, down, and, and you'll you'll see what it looks like. Is that the Kodiak Scorpio? Yes. Oh, oh dear lord! Real pain in the ass to clean. <laughs> like if you get one of these things, shoot non corrosive ammo out of it. It's available. Okay. It's not that expensive. Don't shoot corrosive out of it because it is gobstoppingly hard it to looks uh, very difficult to take apart, especially compared to the standard SKS. Yeah. Uh, and then I noticed on CGN that uh, Maple Ridge Army said that the uh, Mavericks are shipping, uh, and I put that note in the show notes here. And then Bullseye called me uh, just this, this afternoon and like, "Hey, here are Mavericks in. Would you like to?" pay your remaining because i just did a pre-order with them so i did that and uh and then at the same time i'm like oh you know what i'd really like to get is some sig mags and i need some sig mags because i got some well not sig guns but kind of sig ish <laughs> sig ish guns uh, this is a norinco np22 uh this uh-huh. is a sig p226 uh version this is this one's not factory this one's got like a whole bunch of go fast parts that the uh, previous owner put on it uh, he put on the uh, the Sig E2 grips, which is kind of like more like a Shadow 2 kind of a kind of a grip to it. It actually puts your hand higher up on uh, on the on the grip. And if you wanted to see a comparison, there's an MP34. Yeah. On this one, your hand is quite a bit lower. Um, if you want to know the MP34, uh, shorter slide. You still got the barrel sticking out the end, anyways, because we're in Canada and yep. and there's rules Reasons. and stuff. Um, the grip's also shorter. And if I reloaded this thing too quickly on the on the move, I would yep. pinch the shit pinch out of my pinchy. pinky, just jam that thing in there. It would, it, I can feel it right now. It would just pinch right there. So you'd have to do pinkies out when you reload with this thing. <laughs> <laughs> British reload. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, long story short, if you're just mm-hmm. doing it for competition, I would get the MP22. The grip is uh, it's a little bit a bigger. Longer. The slide's yeah. longer. Uh, you've got like you know some distance there. That's uh, that's different in terms of the the slide length. Um, and again, for competition, heavier, longer is is generally better. better. Yeah, yeah. Although I don't know, these aren't these aren't like a fantastic competition pistol either. They're just I don't know. It's an old design. Like the the uh, here. Let me let me piss some people off. Just like I piss people off about the Berettas and my my hate for them. Uh, <laughs> This is a 40 year old design, like this pistol. Yeah. There's some cool things about it, like the, the decocker and the fact that there's no safety is on it. Oh, I love it. Oh, yeah, decock. It's safe now. It's got like a, this one's got a 12 pound two stage trigger. So, yeah, it's safe. <laughs> you can carry it with that. It's never, it's not going to go off. Uh, single action is uh, four or five pounds, a little bit nicer. 
Yeah. Uh, I like that. that. That's kind of interesting. But like the, the trigger pull is not as good as some of the other guns out there. Uh, the weight of them, like the, it's, it's a metal frame, but it's just aluminum. So it's not quite yeah. as heavy as like your shadows and that kind of a thing. And then the, the grip and where the bore is like the bore over grip is, is quite high. Like the SIG 226 style pistol. It, it is the highest out of any why, common yeah. pistol. That's why I hate those things so much. Yeah, they're just they, they buck quite a bit when you uh, yeah. when you fire them there because they're you got that that rotation that torque coming from from the top here and there's just not a lot of meat behind it to stop it. it they're in nine millimeters, so it doesn't matter yeah. that much. But if you're shooting Ipsic, that is a little bit. That is a little bit. I don't know. So uh, other things that are kind of interesting the because the grip size is different. Uh, the mags kind of fit, so you can take the short gun, the MP34, and you can put the MP22 mag in there. It'll work. It looks dumb, but it'll work. Wouldn't pinch your pinky. Correct. Yeah, uh, you, you, you can't. You can't do the the other way. It just doesn't go far enough in there. Yeah. So. Hit it. Hit it. I got it. Hit it harder. Harder. Hit it harder. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. So you could put a bunch of sick parts in it. This one's got like. I don't know, SIG hammer, SIG, you know, takedown lever release, yada, 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 a whole bunch of stuff in it. It's got a marginally better trigger pull on it. Um, the decocker is a little bit nicer. So you pull, press the decocker down on this one. It actually holds the hammer back nice. and you can slowly let it forward. Whereas yeah. on this one, it's more of like a, you pressed it, it's going forward. It's not going to fire, but it's it's kind of like a, I don't know, less nice. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> what did those cost you? a pittance <laughs> so, like 300 whatever. each kind of a thing yeah, yeah, so whatever. Whatever. Yeah. as opposed to 1300 or whatever they are new so. uh, the, i think the two c6s are right around a yeah, thousand bucks thousand bucks to oh, one yeah. of those things up depending if you get used or whatever um which is quite a bit for what they are I, like if you were to get like the three if you wanted to get a good shooting pistol also by sig the 320 p320 yeah. x5 great shooting pistol not 40 year old technology 10 year old technology five year old technology a lot better um yeah so um work i actually i just i already put i haven't got out to the range with them just yet but i published an article just because i did like a crap ton of research on them and uh it's already long enough where i kind of think i'd just rather share it with people so i put that out i'll update it once i've got out and shot I'd like to shoot a couple of matches with these things, ideally, mm. just to prove like the can you do it? Because I shot him, I shot a match with the Gersan MC28, and like it didn't feel very good compared to my Shadow, but it worked. Yeah, I think these, this one, this one's got a four pound trigger pull. It's a heavier gun. It should be better to shoot than the MC28, right? Mm-hmm. No, first first trigger pull will suck, but after that should be fine yeah is, is this like a, a project you have going on to shoot competitions with just the crappiest guns you can possibly find and see how you yes. make out yes yes cool. yes um, to be real like yes yeah well I, I i put in an article on like the cheapest handguns in canada and part of this is when i actually like shoot it at a match like does it survive a match do i run across like horrific problems uh, so I ordered some Sig mags because apparently the Sig mags don't fit the Norks, and uh, my Dremel is going to find out what it takes to make them <laughs> fit the, the the Nork guns, and uh, and then I'll share it with everyone, and then everyone will know how to right. how to make that happen. Nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna do that. Um, I'm still waiting on my reg certs for like everything. So I got that Terra TM9 on the seventh. Still yeah. on reg cert. It's been a month. What the hey? Yeah, I just assume know, Ontario, um, that would not be unusual. But I'm, I know. Well, I, I suppose I'm being uh, like the the mail comes from Miramichi, right? For the reg certs. Mm-hmm. This can't be an Alberta thing. This has to be some sort of federal government thing for it to be this bad. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah. It has to be. Agree. It has to be from Miramichi or something like that. Yeah. So. I don't know. Maybe they don't have the printers. Maybe the person who's supposed to do the printing is like on extended holidays and uh, they can't hire another person because they're union or some stupid bullshit reason why I can't get a well, registered in a month. Of course and they're it, union. 
and and they changed it so you can't take the uh you can't use the transfer notification which has the registration number on it you can't use that to go to the range you can just use your registered so i'm waiting on a fucking card so i can go to the range yep a that's insane and b why do I get the transfer and then I get the registration later when the transfer has the registration number on it? Why don't they arrive in the same envelope? Hey, you know, it's, uh, it's 2021. Um, why don't email. you just email, email that shit to, to me? me. I'll yeah, print, print it. it. I'll, I'll print them all on one piece of paper. Oh, it'll be great. And I'll just like I'll put it in a binder. Hello. That's my take, take to the, the range world. binder. Go green. Or oh, oh, oh. attach it to my card. And you're good. What? What about attaching it yeah. to my card, guys? It's all yeah, digital, yeah. anyways. No, yeah. let's not do that. That's that's dangerous. What if you're? What if I was in the <laughs> middle of nowhere with a, with my handgun and the cops like, oh, I don't know if this is <laughs> legit or not. <laughs> uh, and other made up scenarios that the uh, government likes to think up of. Uh, anyway, so I'm so I'm still waiting on registers. I'd like you're to starting get, to sell like Trevor, you know. I'm just, just a little like, bit grumpy about like not getting my registers on these I because know. I've been sitting on them. I've been going to the range every weekend, and I have to leave these super cheap crappy pistols at home and i want to shoot them at home yeah. See, that, that's one thing with learning about firearms and learning about our regulations they start to make you everybody i know who does this it starts to make you pretty dismissive of the laws in general because you start to realize how much of them are bullshit yeah. and then you wonder i wonder what laws that i don't know about that are also bullshit and then mm. you find out that the answer is well most of them All actually of them. yeah 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 yeah. Anyway, yeah. you know those other ones that sounded really good when you heard the politician talk about them? They're bullshit. Yeah. They're or that bullshit. law already existed, but this. Yeah. One, you okay. Yeah. Guys. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyways, I need I would... to get this drain rack back. Up. Okay. So, anyways, thanks. Hi. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, the host. Thank you. Um. Uh. So, video. I put out some videos on Laser Academy tech sites. The Magneto yeah. Speed one is going to go out tonight. Uh. I've got videos on you know these pistols i gotta put out the terra tm9 i'd like to go to the range so i can get some like you know a few hundred rounds through it well the rcmp is listening so maybe you guys mary machine could get your asses in gear so please put it in the mail go shoot his gun so i know, you pass I know that it's on. sitting on the counter you guys have just been like avoiding it <laughs> put it in the mail please put a stamp on it <laughs> uh working on sks optics versus iron so is there a point in in, in putting optics on uh spoiler no unless unless you've got like eye problems <laughs> no doesn't matter uh and then i've got a tech site ts100 that's coming from the states uh eventually someday someday uh, yeah yeah and i'll do that one that's Thanks the same thinking. thing as the ts200 except it's got a little flippy thing on yeah. the back and you'll do the Pretty. difference between the two. I will do that thing. Oh. It yes. will be a video. Oh and uh, and I told Rick from uh, Bullseye he should carry those tech sites because <clears throat> we don't really have them in Canada. There's, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the image. You actually found a way to make SKS is uglier. <laughs> uh, yeah, it does make them a little bit uglier. They can get uglier. There are uglier SKSs out there. Anyways, yeah, right. anyways, I yeah. would uh, I would love to shoot my cheapo pistols. Sherwood Park's doing like Thursday night uh, practices with like pistols and stuff like that. I want to go to more of those mm-hmm. and bring some cheap crappy guns and yep. shoot them there. Thursday night is my black patch practice as well. Ooh. We might have to change the day that we do. Listeners. Our- Mm-hmm. We might have to change our viewers might have to change when we record these things. You bet. So we can get some more shooting in. Mm-hmm. And then I got to do some maple seed stuff. I got to get some events going. I got some events. Uh, we're locked down a little bit here in Alberta. I don't know. I, I, you, you wouldn't think it, look at, uh, you wouldn't think it's the way that we act, but we've actually got the highest uh, active case count in Canada. Number but, uh, one, number one, number oh, one. Oh, we, we got to win. And uh <laughs> And yeah, we can we can still do ten person events. So yeah, mm. we can. Yeah. Oh, anyways, anyways okay. that's it for me. All right, let's go into upcoming events. Upcoming events is sponsored by Tila Alpha. It's Canada's digital agency that works exclusively with the Firearms Vertical. Uh, they help with business processes, strategic planning, websites, e-commerce, and battling the stigma that the industry uh, carries with banks, merchant processors, and social media. Those damn. Facebook people. Anyways, uh, check out uh, uh, tilaselfa.com. Check them out. 
Uh, we don't have anything listed in the upcoming events. If anybody does have an upcoming event, just send it to our slamfireradio at gmail.com. We'll put it in here and we'll talk about it a little bit. We do have some news that is happening, though. Uh, let's talk about the CCFR Legal Fund Donations, uh, Legal Challenge Fund Donations. So we got, like, the first one is, like, oh, my God. So Sask Rivers Chapter, or SCI, they donated $17,500 to the Legal Challenge. Uh, Club Tier, Sand Hill, Sand Hill de Chirac, that's my French accent, uh, People that, uh-huh. yeah, Club de Tire, Sand Hill, the Shirk. Anyways, $100. Peace River Fishing Game Association or the PCFGA, 2500 Frontenac Rifle and Pistol Club, my club, uh, $2,500. Salmon and Arm Fish and Game Club, $500. And the Sportsman Club in Gulp, Three Gun Club. So the Three Gunners, they passed around a hat and they came up with $700. So congratulations to these guys. Hey, Adriel. I have a donation as well. Uh, do you? I did. I donated $100 last week because I went Aww. on the CCFR webpage and I joked, Aww. which I've done multiple times. But I joked that uh, if I had $100 for every time somebody said something stupid on the CCFR <laughs> Facebook page or mocked the CCFR <laughs> for not doing anything, if I said if I had a penny, I'd have $100. And this morning, I donated that $100 to the CCFR. So. Well, thank you. Well, why don't we talk? A- that's awesome. I put 50 bucks in last week, but that's not $100. No. Thanks, though. Poor people. Okay. <laughs> so why don't we talk about the le- CCFR Legal Fund? legal challenge fundraiser challenge that we have Adriel, you want to talk about it because we had somebody who donated and we're going to give Here, here's the deal you're going to donate to the ccfr legal challenge you need to email that receipt to us afterwards and say like yo i donated and uh maybe we'll send you a 1022 receiver maybe you'll be like one of many people that'll be in the pool correct what sort of 1022 receiver would that be, Adriel? And who donated it at Adriel? That would be a gray birch. So many questions. It will be the CLR, which uh, is not a cleaner, but it is their <laughs> standard zero MA, MOA rail on top. Right. Is Machined there any, in. Is yep. there any special reasons why we're using it? For it's a CCFR the, on it. Yeah, it's a laser engraved with CCFR logo yeah. on it. So and it's numbered. So you can use you can win donated. one of those. Hey Adriel. Hey, what's, what's the other option that you can do? Is it just for actually sending in a donation, <laughs> sending us a photo of it? Or how else can you win one of these amazing CCFR? You could go to Armory DC Gunsmith and, uh, I don't know, say you want to win it and they'll tell you what to do, which make is a make a donation. Yeah. 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 Yep. So there's going to be a couple of them. So mm-hmm. go and do that. Hey. there's Your odds are very good right now. You have like, th- these, are, these are the best odds you're going to face all year. Yes. So if you so, want like a pimpin' 1022 receiver mm-hmm. and to help the CCFR mm-hmm. is the way to do it. And, and if you're helping the CCFR, you're helping yourself. Okay, True. so when's the draw date? Uh, May 27th. Okay. Do we have a shout out for this week? Bradley K has donated $40. <laughs> Excellent job. I like how you're prompting me the whole way through this. I try to like wing it and half ass it. And you're like, no. You're going to say all the things, and I'm going to make you. My, my theory is that Adriel just wants Kelly to do it. So it's yeah. it really, really difficult. So she'll just be like, ah. <laughs> okay, I give up. Fine. Uh, all right. So the, last week, we had our April Fool's show, and there were some things that we talked about that maybe I think some people were kind of wondering if it was actually true or not. This is one of the things that I think some people thought wasn't true. <laughs> hmm. So... That's a real right. thing. We're doing this thing. Do you want me to this read is... this thing? Yes, please. I'll read this one. I'll read it in my radio voice. Thank you. Do, you. do you have a face for radio? Are you willing to work for scale? I don't know what that is. Is that an RC car thing? <laughs> nothing. That's what it oh. means. For nothing. Oh, for nothing. Oh, like pay versus our amount that we get. Okay. Mm-hmm. You could get stock options too. Well, we're here looking for a part-time host, specifically someone who can fill out when one of us is lame, lazy, or ill and cannot make it. 
We are hoping for someone who will round out or compliment the rest of us, particularly complimenting Kelly. That will get you bonus points. And our disciplines. If you're interested, here is what we'd like you to do. Submit a voice message and a brief bio about yourself and why we should pick you, why you're not a loser. You can send the message and bio to slamfireradio at gmail.com or message on Facebook. The deadline for submissions is April 30th. Excellent. Thank How you. That? Awesome. Yay. It was really, really well done. I'm uh, helping. You're helping. Yeah. So we are looking for a part-time host, everybody. It wasn't an April Fool's joke. The other one that wasn't, uh, by the way, (laughs) even though we eat chicken all the time, I am still somebody who is, I'm not a proletarian. That was mine. Anyways. That was a funny um, one. I'm not, I'm not going to shoot a wolf with an FX9. Yeah. Well, you couldn't. The gun's just gonna blow up anyway. <laughs> Maybe just let the, let the wolf let the wolf look. shoot the FX nine, and it'll blow itself up. Mm. Got to get him by the ejection port. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. sneak up. Mm-hmm. So before we get into the news, uh, new guns and news stuff, uh, can we actually talk a little bit about what's happening next week? So this is episode three hundred and ninety nine. Oh, so guess what next week is. Because math. Episode 399A. No. Part, two. <laughs> Part two. Part two. Part two. So next week is our 400th episode. Hey. So so what we would like you guys to do is send us an email. Uh, tell us what your favorite over the 400 episodes or 399 because technically not, it's 400 next week. Send us an email. Tell us what your either your favorite episode was or moment or guest or anything like that. And you can send it to slamfireradio at gmail.com and oh. we would read it on next week's episode. Bonus points if you binge watch all 400 out 399 episodes, film yourself doing it, and then fast forward the entire thing and make one video out of it. You'll get bonus points if you do that. No, no. What would that take? I don't, I don't care. It's not my time. 400, 800 hours. Yeah. Get uh, on it. 24 hours in a day. It'd take a month. You'd have to leave <laughs> on play for a month straight. So you would have to open the audio files in multiple players on your computer and play them all. Listen once. to them concurrently. You can do it in two hours. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Good move. Four, Good move. 400. Yeah. Very effective. Okay. Awesome. So, yeah. So send that to us as well. Or you can actually share through social media like on Facebook or Instagram yeah. or whatever. Looking forward to the stories. It's going to be awesome. Okay. So news, 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 news. You want to talk about it? Yeah. Uh, U.S. gun control. It's coming. Uh, uh-huh. Biden made an announcement today. Now, nothing real happened today, but he basically said, I'm going to tell these guys to do all this stuff now, and they're going to go out and do it. Whether they can or not, I don't know. We'll find out. Um, but I'll list off the stuff here. And we'll see if it happens. This wasn't actually, if you look at Biden's gun control platform, there's a very small part of it, it looks like. Um, so maybe more will come later, or maybe <laughs> he's wait, just going to. There's more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is all U.S., but we have we have plenty of U.S. listeners. Um, so it's it's worth going over a little bit. Yep. Um, they're going to prohibit 80% lowers as ghost guns. Those aren't like. Have fun making a flintlock rifle with your son or daughter or something like that. No, those that's a ghost gun. It's bad. Um, and the same with the eighty percent ARs and all that kind of stuff. So those are going to get banned. Uh, no more braces on handguns. Which um, in Canada you'd be like, what are you even talking about? But in yeah. the U.S., uh, if you want a rifle with less than sixteen inch barrel, it has to be a pistol, and they're a- they're therefore they're ARs. Uh, uh, can't have stocks on them until uh, they actually had a, a, a vet, uh, an injured vet who couldn't shoot with two hands. And he uh, got a brace that would attach to his forearm so he could shoot yep. his AR pistol. Uh, and they got around to like, okay, yeah, that's allowed. That's a pistol. That's a brace. It's fine. You can put a, it can strap to your arm. You can rest on it. Oh, it looks kind of like a stock, but it's still just a pistol. So who cares? And uh, now they're going to change their mind on that and they're all going to be SBRs. And I, the last Epson, uh, estimate I looked at said that there were between two and four million of those in the U.S. <laughs> Which yeah. Yeah. might, uh, there's another provision that th- that they might be able to hit on, which is uh, uh, if it's in common enough use, uh, 2A applies to it, 
So they that might actually be a good thing um, because they might be able to just say no, that's two A. You can't you can't uh, can't do anything about that. I I wish them best of luck if they prohibit them and tell people to turn them in. <laughs> yeah, four million of them. Yeah, yeah this that's... is America. This is not Canada. People will. Yeah. I've talked to a few Americans about this whole thing, and they're like, I, I'm just going to ignore that. <laughs> I'm going to pretend you didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm just not listening. We're so, really dumb. He's using an executive order to bring us in. Uh, no, I believe with these, he was asking. So uh, he's asking the ATF to reclassify some of this stuff. So okay. it, 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 some of this is is yet to come. Some of this is he wants other people to do his dirty work. It's exactly. so like one of the things is he um, he took one of the guys who did Waco and he's like, you seem like an upstanding citizen. I'm going to put you in charge of uh, the ATF. So, uh, so that happened. Um, and he's apparently just a anti-gunner and, and whatnot. So a very I looked, political. Uh, I looked him up. He's a senior advisor for every town for gun safety, fun fellows uh-huh. and a bunch of other stuff mm-hmm. and basically hates guns. So he's perfect. Yeah. Uh, real interesting uh, political appointment there. So yeah. you got some other stuff on here. Red flag, let the red, red flag legislation, legislation yeah which we've talked about in canada here because we we already have red flag legislation but we're getting more and uh there's there's potential for abuse in there and i think in the u.s with the political climate they have yeah. it would be way worse there's yeah. there's very few people who I'd, I'd worry about uh in in canada here doing false flags uh, uh false red flags to to get people in trouble i uh, in the u.s it would like that risk is very high people are going to die because of this yeah. Um, and then he also said, like, we're probably going to do some other stuff. He said we should, uh, but he didn't actually say how or when or whatever. Uh, banned assault weapons, high cap mags, eliminate gun manufacturer immunity from like lawsuits. So if like that's one of his big ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, eliminate the gun show loophole, which is actually like private sales. You can you can yeah. privately sell your firearms to someone else. And that's the that's not a gun show loophole. It was built in like that as, as far as I know. Um, it's one of the good things about one of the good things about here in Canada, we can do certain things like, like we can mail firearms in the mail or we can go and we've already got our license. So we mm-hmm. can just go and pick up a gun. Whereas and uh, not for it. long though, yeah, because C 71 means you have to phone those in. You I could be right next to you. Like I want to sell you this three way bolt action rifle. I have to call the government, ask for permission, so I'm going to sell it to Kelly, get the little thing that says a reference number. Then you have to, do you have to call in? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how C-71 is going to work. They haven't even bothered implementing it. It's just the long gun registry again. It's a, pain, it's a total pain in the ass. If you weren't around for it the first time, it was a real pain in the ass. I kept all my a lot of money too. just to remind me. <laughs> do you remember people engraving their the registration certificate into their gun, like inscribing on the stock yeah. like a caveman? I have a 22 uh, that uh, I, I got when a buddy died, and it has. He took an electro pencil and like cut no. it into the barrel. <laughs> no. Yeah. Because uh, old cooey. So uh, uh, that's that's what it means for Americans. And, and to be honest, Americans, you'll you'll get better news from an American source on what this means. Yeah. But for us Canadians, what this means is, uh, oh, ammo's going to be ammo and guns are going to be hard to find because people in the U.S. are, are probably 40. going nuts right now buying a ball all up. And they were yeah. prior to this too, so yeah, it's it's really it's it's going to be like this for a while. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Might be a long shortage. Might be a long shortage of guns and ammo. Although they, good... they keep coming in, I I still see like PMC and Barnall and uh, and and stuff coming in. Like for for a while there, two two three was up to seven hundred bucks, and most recently I've seen it on sale for right around six hundred dollars per thousand. So, um, we we're still getting cheap two two three in country here. I haven't seen any cheap nine mil yet, but no, nope. I'm not looking. Yeah. So go go yeah. buy it now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it is available. So maybe, maybe this shortage won't be as bad as last time when it just looked like you couldn't like buy anything. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe okay. I gotta go buy some 22. Anyways, that's that news. Okay. All right. So brand ambassador. Slimefire Radio is a brand ambassador for Bolt Action Coffee. The coffee is roasted in small batches, and it is the bomb. Go and buy some. You can have it sent to your home by going to boltactioncoffee.com. 
And you can use the Slamfire radio as your discount code, and they'll no, send you it to will, you. you will use the discount code. No, yeah. you, no you might. You yeah. will. So go and buy some. Good yeah. coffee. Coffee makes the world a better place. It really, really <laughs> does. All right. What's new and new gun stuff? Well, every once in a while, we talk about uh, Profit River and their amazing Vortex sales. One yep. is coming up soon. So when? I don't know. We'll give notice the exact time that it'll go live. Please do not contact us. We want to be fair. 24 hours ahead. So I'd pay attention because these prices are like half Ridiculous. what they normally are. They're like half off retail. These are open box or demo uh, yep. optics, optic mounts, all that kind of stuff. So if you're looking for a fancy Vortex scope, no. uh, these prices are fantastic. And I kind of want to get one of these red dots because I kind of want another red dot. I thought I saw a couple in here. Not the crossfire. They've got the, a couple of vortex uh, venom red dots and the razor red dot as well. I kind of want like two hundred and sixty bucks for a venom. I want one of them. I'm kind of interested got, in some of those uh-huh. strike, strike eagles. Mm. Nom, nom, nom. Yeah, mm. mm-hmm. it's always a great idea to check them out. Profit River has some really good deals on stuff. Yeah, this these ones in particular are. Awesome. unbelievably good yeah so uh yeah. i am looking forward to that uh okay. and then this other one um right. you know i'm doing this cheap pistol thing and yeah, yeah. uh boy i am like this close this close uh. to buying one of these things but i just don't want to because i've had berettas in the past and uh same complaint about the sigs there it's you know 1980s technology ancient yeah yeah but you why stop <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Anyways, uh, who are these guys? Great, no- Great North Great Gun Co. Yeah, uh, has Italian police surplus Beretta ninety twos for three ninety nine. It's that oh, that price is good. So you were just good. saying that you're doing a comparison. Come on, yep. giddy up. Uh, <laughs> these are cheaper than the Gersan like Turkish copy Beretta ninety twos. And they're about the same price as the Norinco SIG copies, but you get a real Beretta one. It's mm-hmm. probably clapped out. It's probably like those, those police have been, you know. Oh, yeah. Shot the crap out of it. Uh, I yeah. don't think the Italians shoot each other very often, so it's probably hasn't seen a lot of rounds. Probably just a lot of holster wear. A lot of the cops, no. <laughs> yeah. No. Oh, you can pay a little bit more, and you can get it with a leather holster and a pistol case. Does it come with an extra mag or still just one? doesn't look like it does comes Mm. with one mag Mm. i think you need to do actually just just do it no yeah yeah but spend the money i I, judge i just spent like a thousand bucks today because i got my that uh maverick and and whatnot paid off oh you're just going to sell them anyway shut your pile true (laughs) true good lord true dave's right (laughs) anyways okay okay yeah I'll, I'll, We're, come, I'll come back. You, to this. you know you're going to buy it. Well, I just I just added it to cart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good boy. All right, let's get into the main topic. So for tonight's main topic, we have uh, Christopher Golden with us, and he's going to be talking to us about archery. It's something that a lot of people are picking up, uh, particularly with the pandemic. Uh, They can get out into their backyard. They are able to actually use it. But not only that, a lot of people are actually exploring it with interest in other shooting disciplines. And it's it's something that is actually taking off in Canada as well. So we wanted to say thank you to Christopher for coming on. Thank you, Christopher, for coming on. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, One of the things uh, we were hoping to have Trevor on tonight because uh, it's a little known fact. Well, not really a little known fact, but Trevor actually uh, is somebody who is uh, in into archery. And not only did he compete, but he actually was also a coach. And Christopher was one of um, the people that uh, Trevor coached. So I thought it'd be a great idea to bring Christopher on and be like almost like a reunion. And it's like six degrees of Trevor. And the reason why I say this is because Christopher's father uh, graduated high school with me. And Trevor was the coach for Christopher. So it's like, it's weird. Six degrees of Trevor Trevor Bacon. <laughs> I thought it was cool. But that's just my I, weird mind. I, I, I like bacon, but no, maybe I don't. <laughs> no. 
Anyways. Anyways, thanks, Christopher, for coming on. We really yeah, appreciate I mean, really appreciate you coming on. Do you want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself, um, where you're located, and specifically some of the archery things that you have done? Because you've been you're quite accomplished, actually. Yeah, I I mean I my whole archery career has been not really a career a hobby, I guess. It's it's been right place, right time for me. Like it archery's grown a lot. When I started when I was young, it was big and then it kind of dwindled a little bit in the Atlantic provinces. I'm in the huge town of Tracy, New Brunswick with a population of six hundred people. And uh you would Kelly would know where that was. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, the uh I, I I Trevor started coaching me. I was around eight years old when I got into archery. Uh my whole family's been big into hunting their whole lives and and archery was just a reason to bow hunt. You could, you could hunt three weeks earlier. So my, my father jumped on that bandwagon to deer hunt and, and bear hunt and all those types of things. And when you're an eight year old kid and you're a redneck and you grew up in Tracy, it's just another projectile to launch. And archery was a, you know, I went to the range once with dad and he bought me my first compound bow the next second night I was at the range. So that's kind of how that, that became uh, a, how that, a big how passion that of mine right there. off the bat. And yeah. uh, after I was 10 or 11, I met Trevor around the age of 10, I believe. And uh, then Canada games were coming up that year in 2007. I was 12 when I went there, a, a guy at the range, he, w- he was another coach. Uh, he said, Hey, you should really, you should try out for the Canada games. I know you're young, but you can go to three Canada games at 12. It goes to your 21 every four years. And I pretty much started from there. And then that's when I, after I got to the Canada games and I was, when I was 12, I, I saw people that were like, they, they seemed to shoot perfect. Like they, they didn't miss. They never left the center. They were just like, I want to be that guy. Mm-hmm. And anyway, that's kind of what, kind of what fueled it. And then Trevor had that same, same passion, same drive, same everything. It's the ironic, funny thing is, is I always used to argue when I was a little kid, I was huge into guns too, as a, as a little redneck kid. And as I was at the range with dad and stuff, shooting, shooting trap and skeet and that. And, uh, I always used to argue with Trevor that, that guns were cooler than bows. And at the time, Trevor might not like me saying this on a gun, <laughs> gun podcast, but he was very archery at, at that time, archery, archery, and there's nothing better than archery. And I said, ah, guns are pretty cool. Now I'm on yeah. a podcast that Trevor's involved with, and I'm talking about archery on his gun podcast. So. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of ironic. If you if you follow the podcast, there's a lot of irony in what Trevor says. Okay. Anyways, getting back to it. You said, let's go back to, so you met Trevor when you were like 12. You went to uh, Canada Games. Yeah. First that Canada Games, after. Trevor wasn't there. Tre- that was in Whitehorse. Second Canada Games was in Halifax. And uh, around the time I was 16, going into the second Canada Games was my first uh, first time I, I tried out for Worlds and, and went to Worlds. And uh, I, I was the alternate the first year at Worlds. I was 14. I missed the trial for Utah. I, was messed a, I missed a medal match by a couple or a, a qualification match by a couple of points to get in on Team Canada. And then the next year, I Trevor started working with me a lot. He, he really everything I'd done with archery i owe to trevor is just the the mental aspect for the technical aspect rate to tuning um i'll get into some of that later but uh that was he 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 kind of he kind of put it in you can go in your backyard and, and practice you guys probably would know that you you can anybody can pull the trigger anybody can just fire arrows but if, if you don't shoot it with a purpose you don't have any fundamentals down of what you're doing and he, he helped me really get in depth with it i guess and then go really competitive and that summer, I went to Poland in 2011 and went on to China two years after that, and then Pan Am Champs in Argentina. So he kind of he kind of gave me the push to really go to like the world world level. So that was so. Well, congratulations! Thanks. One of the other one of the other things that you actually have done is you were also the flag carrier for Canada. Yeah, that was that was pretty cool. And again, that was right place at right time. I, I mean, I had the opportunity to go to Canada Games with some pretty spectacular athletes. Jake Allen went to the Canada Games in 2007. Uh, I mean, right place at the right time. And because I had coaches like Trevor and people that thought a lot of me and they, they wrote big, big lists of resumes of stuff that I've done. It was just uh, they were really good. And they were pretty adamant about trying to get me to be a flag bearer. I didn't know any of this at the time. They wanted to kind of surprise me and I remember getting that phone call from uh, one of the head mission staff at the Canada Games for Team New Brunswick, and uh, that was that was pretty sweet. That was a pretty fun night. I enjoyed that. Wow! Congratulations! Yeah, on that, that was pretty pretty cool. You're representing it's, it's Canada. Your sport at a at a big event like that, it's really nice to promote your sport too. Like it's yeah. you know because they, they say you're underneath Christopher Golden Archery, and 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 uh, even better, there was there was two other archers, uh, one from Team Manitoba and one from Team Saskatchewan that I went to to Worlds with in Poland and China. And they were both flag bears also for their, their provinces that night. So that was pretty, archery got That's a really cool. good, actually got a really good promotion that night. It was pretty, pretty great. 
So that's nice. awesome. That's yeah, it was pretty, very cool. Pretty fun to see. So yeah. So a lot of people, as I said, archery is really starting to pick up. Like, um, yeah, you can see it everywhere basically uh, gun stores are actually bringing in equipment and also um like i'm even starting to pick it up too so what you started when you were quite young yeah all right so if a youth shooter not a youth shooter so somebody is a youth uh or somebody that is actually just a beginner as an adult what do they need to do to actually get into our tray what do they need to know where should they go what should they do? The, and we'll take them through the process. Okay. The 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 my favorite part about archery is it it is it's competitive. It's as competitive of you as you, as you want to make it. Like mm-hmm. any any range you go to or any club you go to, I I would suggest to a, a family or or a, a younger kid who wants to get into archery, just show up at your local range and you will hardly walk through the door and someone will be probably passing you a bow or they'll say, hey, you should try this or what can I do for you. Archery is very friendly and and I've never met a single person that doesn't want to try and promote archery. We've always kind of had that. It's almost like a family. Even if you, even if you go to a shoot outside of your province, it's like if we can't have nationals with the COVID and stuff, which I miss, but uh, uh, even if you go to a, to an event at at nationals and there's, there's a hundred people there that you've, you've seen, you've just, I've been going to nationals. I have missed the last few years for work and, and life getting away, but uh, you, you've been seeing the, and grew up with those same people for the last decade, you get to know them pretty well. So, mm-hmm. you know, and we all kind of share that same want to grow our sport and, and how many, you know, every year at nationals, you see more and more and more little kids and we continue to try to do that the best we can. So, uh, and it all starts at a local range. I, I you know, uh, here in New Brunswick, uh, Atlantic archery center right outside in, in Fredericton, uh, archery and paintball center in the industrial park. That's where I've been shooting since I was eight years old. The gentleman there is fantastic with, with equipment and set up with little kids. Um, and, and, and that's goes for every place across the country really. And, and, uh, I would say, don't, don't complicate it. Uh, try a couple different bows. Even if you're a little kid, there's, there's always a lot of ranges have bows that everybody can use on the rack, whether that's just a, a traditional bow. It's, it's hard to set up a compound bow for a new beginner, but to see okay. if you like it, I mean, it, it's enough to get you hooked. It was enough to get me hooked when I was a little kid. Um, and, and is for, for older, older people who would like to get into archery, most people at a range will, will let you with COVID restrictions right now, it's kind of tough to, you can't touch everybody else's bow and you have to shoot in a little booth. And anyway, but when the world spins again, most people at, a, at an archery range will let you try their equipment. Like they'll say here, like try my release or try, try a shot out of my bow. You're similar to my size. Tell me what you think before you go spend two grand on an archery setup, try something simple and see if you like this. So, um, if, if you, if you go to a, if you go to any range, really the people there will do the rest for the most part. It's like you, if I see a little kid at the range and he's looking at my bow and he's all excited about it, I'm going to, you know, I'll go, I'll go pick up one of the bows in the racks. They hear me and try this. Right? And so, you'll offer, you'll offer that to him. And for sure. And everybody will do that really. Yeah. Right? I, I found, so I, I'd say don't, you know, you don't have to be shy. It's, it's not like, it's not like hockey where if you're the little kid, it's where you're really small for your age or you're, you know, you're not physically to there to play the, a certain, you know, a high demanding, you know, uh, like, you know, a really physical sport or something like yeah. that. Uh, it's archery is not like that. You, you know, it's very friendly. It's, it's very, it's, it's, it's a really, it's a pretty inclusive. It's, it's very inclusive. Like anybody yeah. from, from, if you can, from four to 84, if you want to, you know, everybody's okay. yeah, it's really good that way. You mentioned a uh, traditional bow versus compound bow. What's the difference between the two? Compound is anything with a traditional bow. A lot of people throw the different terms around. Uh, a recurve like would be recurve? Olympic yeah. style. Like what you see in the Olympics, it, it boils down to wheels or no wheels. Okay. Right? Cams <laughs> or no cams. I've got a bunch of stuff. Do you want to show it actually? Yeah, sure. So, okay. So like when we say cams or wheels on a bow, we're going to have a lot of room in here. This is all decked out. So when we say cams on Sweet. a bow, these great big wheels right here. Yeah. So yeah. Stormtrooper bow. Yeah. Yeah. So I got to take the stabilizer off. So this is just for balance when you're aiming the bow. This this aims this this and this piece in the back. That's what aims everything. It just makes it sit still. That would be like, I don't know if that'd be like a compensator. I don't know if you guys play around with like the lengths of your stocks on rifles for competition. Absolutely. Shooting. Yeah. So like similar, yeah. like whatever makes it sit for you, the best setup you can roll with. Yeah. Um, so pretty similar 
So this would be considered a compound bow. This would be considered a target bow. I've got a hunting bow beside me too. I'll get into that. Sure. Um, target bows typically the longer, the longer, the better, the more accurate. It would be the same as, as you go into the range. You, you probably don't take your AR to shoot 800 yards. You, you take something with a 26 inch barrel and a heavy bullet. And, you know, so, yep. so a target bow typically is like your axle to axle, which is from the, you see the axle in the, in the, in the limb um, there. Yep. That's the, the longer for target, the more you get away with the okay. height from the height from here to here, the longer Very the arrows on the string more forgiving it is simple things like that um so same as a rifle in a lot of ways for a scope windage at the elevation at the top this is adjustable windage on the side it's a little button on the side here so left and right, left and right up and down yeah. there's a peep sight in here bow draws back i shoot a dot if you can see the dot yep okay put the dot on what you want to hit and, and it's so that's the rundown kind of a lot of people, if I'm getting too technical with this, tell me to slow down. Or, we're, uh, we're nerds. I tend to talk really fast for explaining things. I've been told a lot. I get excited about things. Um, <laughs> so a lot of people will shoot a, a type of release device. The other difference in yeah. recurve is you have to shoot with your fingers. So recurve people would have like oh. a, they would have like a tab, like a leather tab. They would draw with their three fingers and they would anchor underneath their chin. Yep. And they, well, they wouldn't, they, they don't have any let off. They don't have any rollover on their cams. It's, it's, it's a more difficult to shoot recurve. I haven't shot a lot of recurve, but why okay. they don't allow compound in the Olympics yet. They were fighting to get it in. It hasn't yet. But anyway. Uh, so lots of people will use like a handheld device like this, which hooks on a loop when you draw your bow back mm -hmm. When you come into full draw and you would look through the site and you're anchored on your nose. I could draw this back, but it's not a lot of room here. So there's different versions of these. This is on a, this is on like a seer and a moon. It's on like a seer and a moon. And, and this, you just, this just fires with rotation. You just, you're gradually just rolling your hand, relaxing your hand until the shot fires and away it goes. That's it just, it's a device to allow the, the bow to shoot something. Some people prefer a trigger. So this one would hook on, there's actually a barrel, like a, like a, any trigger you would squeeze, pull the trigger, the shot. Oh, this is really cool. Yeah, so. it's very similar to shooting. Yeah, in a lot of ways, Trevor always told me that long range shooting, he said, reminded him a lot of archery. Like you try to ring your 308 out to 800 yards. It's very similar. The, the fundamentals of that and the mental aspect of that are very similar to archery. Mm -hmm. um, indoor archery, we shoot 18 meters. Outdoor archery for compound is as, is as far as 50 meters. We used to shoot 90. They changed the rules. Um, the, the distances have varied a little bit, but for better venues and easier access to certain venues, it's, it's hard to get a venue for 90 meters unless you're on a soccer field, which isn't always doable at a lot of nationals in a big city. So yeah. what, uh, they, they, what size of targets are you shooting with a compound at, at 20 meters? 20 meters look like this. Cause I shoot these guys at 20 meters, but I can't yeah, like, what, yeah, that's exactly it. I, uh, there's, there's different ruling of different target sizes. Uh, and in the U S in America, they shoot, they shoot the ones that, depending on the tournament, they shoot the big rings. You see a 10 ring and you'll see other targets that just have that little X ring right here. Mm -hmm. You probably have another ring on your target behind you. Um, so this I'm not shooting that very often. That other, <laughs> ring would be a, that other ring would be a 10. <laughs> so that's the, that's the size. This is about the X is about the size of a nickel. A 10 to be a roughly the size of a toonie. I'd compare it to a toonie, 10 ring, a toonie, and, and the X is about the inner side of a toonie. Pretty close. So. Okay. so is the X more points or it's just your tiebreaker? It depends on the tournament. An X, normally if you were to tie someone, the, it would go by number of Xs. So if you and I were to both shoot a perfect score of 300, it's it's indoors is is three arrows at a time, 10 rounds of three arrows. You get two minutes to shoot three arrows. Uh, outdoors is six arrows at a time depending on the way they want to up, they want to run the shoot. Sometimes you'll shoot three if it's a huge venue, but typically outdoors at 50 meters is six, six arrows. And I think it's four minutes to shoot. It's been so long since I shot an outdoor tournament with COVID. But. Okay. And now is that typical to like, if you, as you go progress through competition as well? So is it the same rules, whether you're at a regional um, Canada? Yeah. There, world? Targets, targets vary in size for age group. Like if you're a younger little, if you're a little shooter, a younger shooter, uh, the, the target sizes, the target sizes vary for okay. some, some little kids shoot at 10 meters until you're, I think it's 10 meters until you're around the age of 10 or so or eight. It's been a while since I've shot that when I was a kid. Um, and then, and then you're shooting, I think it's a 60 centimeter target. 
at 10 and then you back up to the three spot targets like the like in in Adriel's one behind me behind the target I just showed you okay yeah. all right now you were talking also about do you have a, a recurve board there as well so I do not no I don't no? No, okay no. The, what about the you? dark side they're, they're not <laughs> Forbidden, no. Forbidden. <laughs> no, I just, I've never, I tried to shoot a recurve bow once. It was my friend's uh, and I could hardly get it back. I, it was a mess. It was, it was just not good. Well, that's the difference too, right? You also have weight on the drawstring. So yeah. do you want to talk yeah. a little bit about that too? Because it's complicated as well. It, it is, that. yes. So like, again, when, when we say let off, like when that cam is rolling back and it gets to a certain point, and it rolls over. That's your let off on your bow. That's adjustable on a lot of bows. You can you can tweak it. And some bows you can get up to like a ninety percent let off. Some like some guys like to shoot a sixty five. It depends on how much you like to hold. It's a personal preference thing. Recurve doesn't have that rollover. So whatever mm-hmm. your limbs are set at, say you you ordered a forty pound set of limbs for your recurve bow. That bow is forty pounds the whole way back when you're drawing your bow. There's no let off after. So it's much harder to hold, much harder to aim. Um, so I like I could try to show an example. Okay. This is a hunting bow. Yep. If you can see that cam, see how when it's rolling, see how it goes like kind of like tonk, like there's a valley and it lets off. Yep. So that's kind of that's kind of it's hard to draw that in a, a two foot area. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the that's kind of the, the benefit the benefit of of a compound bow in a lot of ways that they're easier to shoot, they're easier to easier to hold. Yeah. You have that you've seen that with that cam rolled. What's the huge difference between your hunting one and the competition so, one? So Probably. again, like I was saying on the hunt on the target bow, everything longer, typically longer is more accurate. The longer that arrow, the the, the quicker, the longer the bow, the the more steady it's going to be. The easier it's going to aim for you. The the longer the distance from the grip to the string, which would be called brace height, that's the faster the arrow gets off of the bow. So if you're going to shake or wiggle or move that arrow has more time to correct itself because it's getting off the, it's getting off the string as fast as possible. So you can see, you can see how short yeah. the distance is from here to here on a hunting bow, which it's, it's designed to be faster. The longer the arrows on the string, the more it has, the more time it has to push it, the faster it's going to be. However, because of that, you get away with less because it'd it be, it'd be like, it'd be like shooting your, your handgun versus your AR, right? It's same same thing. It's easier to probably miss with a handgun than it is with a longer gun. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, you know, it's more kick, more, more wiggle. It's, it, 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 it's, you know, it's, it's designed, it's designed to, it's designed to get an arrow gone fast to, to shoot an animal, not for punching paper. So, okay. and you're that's shooting kind of, and you see like this is, shooting a big this is designed for a ground blind, a tree stand, mm-hmm. something, something not on a field with all kinds of room. Right. Right. So it's going to be a little bit more compact. You're also not going to have all the bells and whistles. You'll still have a scope. It looks like you still have the red yes. dot on that. Do you have a red dot on that one or do you have just for, for hunting? There's, there's various, some people like different setups. So, so on this, you can oh, you see do. multiple pins Yep. on there. Okay. So there's like some people would set those up 10 yards, 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards, 15, 25, whatever you prefer increments of 10 or five. So I don't like shooting multi pins. I've shot, I've shot a single pin my whole life. And again, on a pin, it's the same as, is the other one. I, the other, the other site I showed you where you have a, a, a windage and an elevation. Yep. Um, I'll have, I have an example of that. Hold on. I think I've got, uh, I think I got four pins on mine, on my hunting mm. bow. See, most, most people. So it's just holdovers based yeah. on, based on, um, most people range. Most, most hunting, most, most bow hunters prefer multiple pins because it's easier to get on an animal faster. Yeah. So I prefer, this is my hunting bow. I just, that was my was dad's hunting bow. I had a hold of, I prefer a single pin and I don't know if you can see right, right there. Yeah. That's more or less, that's more or less like a turret. There's all the distance settings on here. You can get Whoa. those, you can, you can, yeah. put, you can design those in a, in a, you can get like certain software that will develop that. If you take the speed of your bow, the speed of your bow, the, the, the weight of your arrows and then the draw length and all the specs of your bow, punch it into a thing is same as if you were designing a turret for a rifle. Yep. Um, and you can print that out. Uh, this is a, this is a metal one. I found a metal one to match. A lot of guys would use a paper one. They'd put it into a, into a, it's a your dope calculator. Software. That's basically what? what it's your dope calculator. It's yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. I like to hunt that way. And, and hunting, yeah. hunting bows are, they're, they're fast. So if, if you see an animal come out at, right now, this is set at 60 yards. If I see an animal come out at, at 40 yards, you can see the site, 
move like you can see that move up and down. So 40 yards, wow. set it to 40 yards, lock it in place. It's ready to go. It's, it's pretty quick. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty higher end hunting site. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, that's in a, in a nutshell, it's really personal preference, whatever, whatever you're more comfortable with in the woods. I like I, I've shot this since I was 10. So that's just the setup I'm used to. Right? Now, do you actually use the, uh, the elevation winded settings or do you just, um, you in sort a hunting, of know where it's going to hit in a hunting situation. I mean, I would, here's the, that's the thing about bow hunting. It's, there's a lot of variables with archery. You're, you're not, you know, you're, you're not, you're not shooting a 300 wind mag. It's, it's slow. It's, it's, you know, uh, you, you got to know your bow. Um, really if, if the wind is a huge factor in a hunting situation, you probably shouldn't have taken the shot uh, to sight this bow in. I'll use the windage and stuff, but in, in, in if I'm, if I'm going to make a, a shot on an animal, uh, archery, you're, you're really not shooting far enough away for the, for the windage to matter a whole lot. You know, your elevation I've, I've, there's tricks to shooting outdoors for, for target archery. When you're shooting multiple shots, you can read the wind in a, in a tournament, they'd have flags and socks on the, on the sides. Like you can see which way the wind's blowing on your target and you can make adjustments for that. Um, every archer does that a little different. There's a level on most bows. You can see a level in my sight, mm -hmm. my scope. Mm -hmm. If you bubble one way or the other, like you, you slightly lean your bow one way. If the wind, for example, is blowing this way, I'm going to lean my bow in a little bit. It's going to tilt my arrow one way or the other. That's a trick, but that's pretty, you're getting pretty technical with that. And in a hunting situation, I I'm not making, I'm not making windage adjustments when I see a deer walk out at 30 yards, I guess. So you already know what your holdovers are based on your comfortability with uh, your bow that you've used for years. Yeah, really. Yeah. The, yeah. the holdover, like I, I don't, I don't like to use any guesswork. Some guys okay. can do it. Guys that shoot traditional would do it. I, I dial, if, if I, mm -hmm. I, I set the range finder at, at an elevation, it's say 30 yards, 35 yards. I set it, but I've never, most people wouldn't set a windage for, for shooting a, 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 in a hunting situation. Most guys wouldn't shoot windage on an animal. Okay. You kind of, that's something you would read. It's something you kind of play with and know your bow. If you're going to, if you're going to be the, a bow hunter to make 60 and 70 yard shots in, in, in the middle of a field and the wind's blowing you, I would say, put your time in, put your practice in, really know what, yeah. know what's, know what your bow is going to do in that situation. My question about specifically the hunting bow, what's your comfortability with what, what's your comfortability where you know you're going to be able to make that shot so can you go out to let's say 100 yards 200 100 would be pushing it your max it's a little i would say on a deer size game for me i've, I've shot a lot of arrows at 50 meters and, and we used to shoot a lot of to 90 meters i'd be comfortable on deer size game out to 50 yards i would say moose are a big target but you got to remember too it really depends on what kind of a setup you're shooting if if you're shooting a 45 pound bow and it's only say 300 feet per second. I wouldn't recommend trying shots on moose at 70 yards. This, this bow was the fastest PSE bow on the market made because, well, I mean, when archery freaking. It's like, you know, <laughs> like, like the toys. <laughs> what's another two, what's another two grand for a bow, right? Great. So, I mean, it's, yeah, same as you guys in guns, right? But yeah. Uh, yeah, this, this, this bow was designed to take a moose out at 70 yards. If need be, I, I'd be comfortable in a moose size game at 70 yards. Knowing my equipment, um, I, I wouldn't say if you're a first time bow hunter to go and do that, but, but deer sight bear, bear, I'd say around the 50 yard mark, same as, same as deer where they're little smaller targets. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's just a ballpark. There's, there's guys that can make, there's guys that can confidently make those shots and, and, um, everything changes in a hunting situation. You can, you can go in your backyard and make 70 yard shots and, and, and hit the, hit the middle all day. And then when that buck of a lifetime comes out in front of you at 60 yards and you start shaking and your arrow drops off your off your rest and, and you, you know, <laughs> you can hardly get it drawn back. <laughs> yeah. But some, some people can stay calm. I'm not one of them. That's for me, bow hunting. I, I've, I've shot, I've shot in multiple tournaments and I've been lucky enough to be on the podium at some tournaments at nationals and, and Pan Am champs and stuff. But to me, there's, there's no rush more than, than hunting. I, I love watching an arrow go through an animal. That's just my thing. I've always been a hunter. Um, that's, that's just my, I'm a, I'm a junkie for that. That's my adrenaline rush. That's, you know, Yep. For me, hunting, hunting is, hunting is where it's at for me. I love target archery, but, but I shoot target archery when both, when, when hunting season's closed, I shoot target archery because well, if there's no season on anything, I can still shoot right. my bow. But so is 3d archery. Is it kind of like a combination of the both of them though? And then you can actually yeah. prepare for hunting, but you can also actually incorporate the, so do you, which bow do you use for 3d archery or do you do 
3D archery. I do. Uh, I'd like to do more of it. I've, I've always, 3D archery wasn't as big when I was involved in target archery. Target archery was pretty big in my province around like when I, when I got into archery. And mm-hmm. now 3D has gotten really big. Uh, yeah. 3D archery is a blast and, and that's, it's, it's great practice for, for hunting situations. And, um, you're still aiming, you're still aiming at, 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 a, at a, at a, at a line or at a, at a certain spot on that animal, which most of them are pretty close, uh, depending on the situation, the, the rings on a 3d animal might not be exactly where I would shoot a, a live animal in a hunting situation, but 3d, 3d archery is, I don't know if you've seen the targets. I should have had yep. an example here. But uh, 3D archery is huge in Atlantic Canada. It's it's growing more and more. Uh, but because uh, I sh- some guys will shoot some guys will shoot uh, unknown 3D. You can shoot unknown 3D or known 3D. I am terrible at judging distance. I would shoot known 3D. So where I know the distance, I don't have to rely on a super fast bow. So I would shoot something similar to my target setup to to get away with more of a if I more of a shake or a wiggle. You get away with a lot more. Um, you, it's a lot more forgiving setup. So I I shoot a target setup for 3D. Um, okay. Some guys will shoot a hunting setup as well. It really depends on what you're comfortable with. Mm-hmm. But if 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 you're a new if you're a new archer and you want to get into bow hunting, I would say take your hunting bow, go to a 3D tournament and and practice. That's the really the the most that's as close a situation as you can get to hunting really. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 great practice. It's a ton of fun. Um, and 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 in a lot of um, outdoor 3D is is the most fun because you can get the most distance. You can get shots further away. Typically, we don't shoot many shots past 50 yards. If it's, if it's an unknown distance course, if it's a known distance course, we'll go it a little further, like out to 16, 70 and 80 yards. It's on, um, most indoor school gyms, you can get up to like 30, 40 yards ish. So it's still really good practice. And, uh, it's, uh, 3d, 3d is 3d is where all the, the, the shooters in the States is where they make all of their money. There's, there's yeah. guys that shoot the international, the IBO and the ASA events and all the big shoots in the States. There's, there's guys that are cleaning up 25 and 30 grand a weekend and sponsors and, and payouts at those shoots. And it's, it's, it's the Whoa. biggest archery. Yeah. yeah archery yeah. target archery. There's, there's three or four big target archery tournaments in the world a year that are like major and most other, most other known sponsored mm-hmm. paid by the bow company pro archers shoot 3d. That's where they're. I would just say that's that because it's is. uh it's more of a spectator sport, like watching people shoot 3d archery is freaking awesome it it's is fun. yeah it's compared fun. to target archery target archery a lot of people used to say it's like watching paint dry but uh <laughs> and, and i i i, I to, and honestly it, i would on i would agree with that you I, would? I, I do yeah. it. watching it is uh yeah unless it's a high stakes target shoot but yeah watching watching 3d like watching a guy watching a guy try to hit the 14 like there's certain certain spots on all animals and and if you if you aim at a certain spot and you miss if you're trying to if you're trying to shoot a higher score than the next guy and one guy shoots a spot on the animal that's worth 10 points. There's a spot that's worth 12 points. There's a spot that's worth 14 points. If you hit a 14 and you miss the 14, you're in the eight of the five. So it's, it's pretty intense to watch a guy hit a spot that big at, at 60 yards on a target that he judged the distance on. And, and, and it's, yeah, it's that, pretty, it gets pretty cool. intense, pretty fast. Yeah, it's, it's it is a blast. Like check out, go on YouTube, check out, check out like the IBO or ASA events or anything like that from the States. It is pretty, it's pretty cool to watch. It's, it's, it gives it a whole new, gives it a whole new, you get, it gives you a whole new respect for the sport really of what those guys really can do. It is, is pretty, is pretty fascinating really. Cool. It is awesome watching yeah. people who are very, very good at shooting. Yeah. Just ridiculous next level stuff. So. I actually also like watching the target shooting. I appreciate the precision. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, me, though. <laughs> for me, that's like watching target rifle. It's so boring. I but I appreciate it. It's the same thing. I appreciate the precision. <laughs> I appreciate it, but I and cannot it is, watch it. <laughs> it. It is precise. Like you, like that target I showed you, you have guys that show up at the Vegas shoot and Lancaster shoot that would that would never miss that inner circle very mm-hmm. rarely like that's and but that's how they make their money right yeah but it yeah t- from a, another from from shooting i know how hard it is to shoot a perfect score and and let alone to be under the pressure of like 50 grand on the line and then all the payouts from your sponsors it's yeah yeah like the, yeah. you know it's to that's block a that all out as a pro and be able to focus on what you're doing and not think about all the other aspects of that it's yeah you got to have a lot of respect for that so can we talk about it a little bit uh about Canada and our trade there's not you said guys down the US those that that's happening down in the US you can go and you can make $40,000 a weekend uh I don't that's think if you win <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah exactly but One I don't <laughs> I don't see a lot of that here in Canada and also yeah. you know you represented Canada as an archer as well 
there there's not a lot of sponsor is there a lot of sponsorship for our for our I, our athletes? I personally I personally know two people who are sponsored. I know one who could I know one guy I went to the worlds with, he could Chris Perkins, he mm-hmm. could call the factory and Matthews would send him whatever he wanted. Um, okay. he, there's, a, he's the only guy I've ever met. That's really, you know, who would be considered a, a pro pro. There's been other, there's been other archers in Canada who have, who have won some, some big shoots and who have, have done very well. Um, but as far as factory staff gets to go to the factory and, and, and help them with designing equipment and, and things along those lines, there, there's very few, like one or two max in Canada that since I've started shooting really. Okay. Um, so yeah, most, you're self-funded right yeah and most that's the situation with most archers and unless you've broken a world record or you got spotted really really young and you've you've won some major shoots it's it's all based on performance really like if you go to a if you go to a a, a big event in the states and you win you're going to get recognized and most people they would they would separate it like i would be considered a vacation archer like and and, and I, i've done okay for for the province i'm in in atlantic canada i've had been fortunate enough to, to, to represent Canada a couple of times, but I would be considered a vacation archer. Like I, I'm going to a, 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 re, a remote place or it's, it's like, say like overseas, like Poland or Argentina. And it's, it's a vacation as well. I'm shooting, whereas they go, it's, it's their job to show up yeah. and win. And I, I still like to go to those shoots with, with doing my best in, in winning in mind when I was competing hard, but you know, like they, there, there's a very different mindset. And if you, if you were to watch a person like me shoot at a local tournament versus a guy shoot, at a tournament in the States or on the Vegas line, you can see there's a major difference there. Okay. Like there's, you know, it's, it's a job more of a hobby for those guys, even though they love what they're doing. It's, 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 it's all a, it's a mental uh, game for sure. It's up there. Well, you gotta that's, have that. that's the other thing too. You talked about a little bit earlier about what had happened when you actually met Trevor and he helped you with the mental mindset of it. Yeah. And what, so is that the biggest piece that's going to, we always talk about equipment, but we also talk about mental mindset and shooting is the biggest piece that's going to get you from being an okay shooter or a good shooter to somebody who's very competitive and basically will go to the worlds and different things like that. So how can, my question to you is how did Trevor help you with that mental piece? And, you know, and how is that going to be helpful for people who want to take it from being a hobby to more of a competitive thing? Um, I would say Trevor, I was lucky enough. Trevor has like, he has, I think he has a psychology degree or he's studied a lot yeah. of all that <laughs> stuff that's way over my head that I didn't question. Trevor was, Trevor is, as you know, Trevor was very like, do it because I told you, <laughs> like, don't overthink it. Just do this and you'll be better. Um, okay. The everybody general, general rule with archery was always said 75% mental, 25% physical. Um, if you can shoot a perfect arrow once you can shoot a perfect arrow 30 times, it's just, you know, how did I shoot that perfect arrow once? Don't focus on what I did wrong. Focus on the good things. Like a lot of new shooters will go to the range and they'll say, Oh, well, like, you know, my, I don't have a really good release yet. Or I, I feel I can't aim. I feel like I, I shake a lot or I, I can't get my feet right. Or I'm fo- focus on one thing at a time, get one thing correct, then move to the next thing. And, and I have lists of, uh, we, Trevor would, would do a lot of exercises where like you go through like, like pro athletes, like what do they do? Like uh, guys in the MLB, there was a pitcher. I can't remember his name. Now he played for the blue Jays. He did 56 things before he threw a ball. He's standing on the mound with the ball in his hand. He did 56 steps before that ball left his hand. Right. So when you, when you, if you want to go competitive, it's archery is all about consistency that like, you can look at everybody on the line. That's a pro archer and not that they look some of them look the same, but there's not two forms of the same. But if you look at those guys, they're all consistent. The shot window they have of when their shot releases is probably within the second every time. So there's something they've done to make that consistent. And for me, and it was, it was sit down with Trevor for hours upon hours and write down every single step that I did in my shot routine from the time that I stood on the line to the time I knocked an arrow to you draw your bow while you're aiming, when you release your shot. Um, I'd say focus on one thing at a time, focus on, focus on setting your grip correctly. Like focus on, focus on the way you hold the bow, focus on the way you draw the bow, focus on the way you release the bow, go stand in front of the target and just don't even, don't even aim at a target. Don't try to shoot for a score. Just try to perfect your form. Stand, stand three feet away, even close your eyes. If you have to, you're not going to miss if you're three feet from the target, right? Mm -hmm. And just 
relax and, and go through every one of those steps and write the steps down as to what you do, because what, what I thought I did, cause I didn't first write my, write that, that shot routine list down when I was in front of a target, Trevor said, write down a shot routine. I wrote down a shot routine and I went on the line and what I thought I did, I had, it was, you know, I missed like, I missed like 25 steps of the things that I did. So Trevor's reading me my list and I couldn't shoot an arrow. Like I forgot to write knock an arrow on my list. Like it seems silly, but there's things that you don't, you don't register until you re- repeat those steps every time. There's, yeah, it's going to seem monotonous and boring, but it's the only way to did some you, form of. Did you use video as well? Did you have people uh, video you? That was like, the second thing I was going to get into. Yeah. Yeah. If you have access to most people do set your phone up, get someone to video you set your phone up on a, on a, on a tripod stand or a camera of some sort and, and just video yourself shooting, see what you did wrong. Even, even get someone at the, at a range to watch you. Who's who, if you, at your local range, there's, I will guarantee you there's someone at your local range somewhere at an archery range who is there all the time. Who's probably an archery freak and would happily watch you shoot. And they could tell you what you've done different from shot to shot. So awesome. that's, that's, that helps a lot. Yeah. How, how much you talk about fundamentals? Ooh we're covering a lot of subjects right now, but, um, yeah. so you talked about fundamentals. So get that under you. Uh, is there a lot of programs? How many programs are there in Canada and across Canada? Are there national programs or the things that you can go to? Are there like coaches that you can actually, can you walk into your local range and there, you know, that there's going to be somebody there that can offer you the fundamentals with consistency and build those skills for you. Uh, very, very few in Canada. I yeah. would say at, at your local range, depending on where you are, if you're in Toronto or a big city or Calgary or somewhere, I would say there's a lot of coaches around, uh, Atlanta, Canada. We do not have a lot of coaches. Not um, in Tracy. Not in Tracy. <laughs> no. I had to go get a bath or for whatever is to get a coach, but yeah. Uh, uh, but I, but I met, I met people that were willing to help me. I've, I've learned as much from other archers as I've had coaches. Um, and, and mm-hmm. for, for the best coaching advice, especially right now, because it's, it's going to be hard to go and find a coach right now, which is not a lot. I would go on YouTube and research the guys like Levi Morgan, like pro archers that will give, they, they have videos and videos of advice. Uh, George Riles is another one. Dave Cousins, Christopher Perkins. Uh, if you're a recurve archer, Brady Ellison. Um, there's a ton of, go on YouTube and just is uh, John Dudley, just YouTube other archers and they have a ton of instructional like they do they get a lot of them get paid because they're, they're promoting a sponsor when they do it they're saying i shoot this bow i do this, use this equipment um but a lot of those guys they they get paid to do that but they'll i know i've i've talked to a lot of a couple of pros that have had the privilege of meeting and, and i'll message them anytime and, and they'll they'll give me advice on what to do for a setup or tuning or mental aspects and um you can learn a lot just from going on the internet and and watching other pros and listening to what they have to say mm-hmm. um, they all have great advice and, and some of them, some not two archers are the same. Everybody has their own kind of their own way of, of getting the arrow to hit the X or the 10 or the bullseye. Um, and at the end of the day, that's, that's all that matters if you can repeat that. So whatever, whatever method works best for you, it's all about consistency. And I would say, you know, just find, find a, find some, find one of those guys advice that you, that you like and, and listen to every video that you can possibly watch on, on that. Okay. If, if you're in this, if you're in a place where you don't have a coach, um, cause finding, finding a, finding a, a template or finding some type of, of training plan on a, on a site, I I've never done that. I was, I was lucky to have Trevor, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, that's what, that's what I would I'm suggest. Go- I'm going to record that. I've never heard anybody say that before. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor said won't be able to get through a door after listening to all no. this. He's pretty no. great. I give him, I give him a hard time, but, uh, he, yeah. he is for, for as far as archery goes, he, yeah, he's pretty much, I, I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have been able to, I wouldn't even be able to get my bow out of the case if it wasn't for Trevor most times. So wow. <laughs> yeah. He's good with guns. He teaches guns the same way. So. Yeah, yeah. He's taught me a little bit about guns and I was always into guns, but I thought I knew about guns. I really knew nothing. I went to the range with Trevor and I, I couldn't hit a, I, I couldn't hit a pie plate at 10 feet with his pistol. So I mean, I could when I left, but yeah, <laughs> and it's just a breakdown of everything. Um, there are so many different, there's so many different bows. There's so many combinations, so many different. So what do you think for people who, you know, just want to try it out. You said go to the range and somebody will say, here, try mine, whatever. But yeah, 
but recommendations for just people to start out, should they actually start out with more of the compound hunting and so they can cover both or should, I know it's kind of like guns. You need different guns for different things, but yes. if, but if somebody wants to get into it. Yeah. Like what's like, what's, what's a, like, what's the bow that I could go if you're coming from the gun, like what's, what's a good 308 bow, right? Yeah. What's your, what's your yeah. good go? What's a good, what's a good firearm that I can shoot a white tail with, or I can go to the range and plink all day if I would it's, like to. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, I would say get, get somewhere in between something in between the, the hunting bow I'm holding and the other white target bow I showed you before, like the, the length of it, there's, there's a, there's a very broad range of that. I would say, this is a 30 inch axle to axle bow. My, my target bow was a 40 inch axle to axle bow. I'd say get something in the middle, get like a 35 inch axle to axle bow, something that's smooth. Uh, this has 70 pound limbs on it, which is it's designed for hunting. My target bow is 60 pounds. Most competition runs 60 pounds. Uh, don't, don't get over bowed. If you're just getting into it and trying to enjoy it, set your bow around like a 45, 50 pound draw cycle. Or if, if you're a grown, if you're an adult, uh, like depending on your size and your stature, like everybody, a lot of guys like to like to get this big, huge, fast at the fastest bow or the most, you know, the most expensive thing on the rack. Um, pretty much every bow is going to cost you money if you want to get into it or get serious about it. But mm -hmm. I'd say get, get a mid range, get a mid range, everything bow without getting really technical. Like I, you know, uh, how much would numbers, a setup cost you probably mm -hmm. just to get in to, uh, again, depends on what you're after. Uh, that's a $600 site. This, the the rods on the bow that was a thousand dollar set of rods this is a fourteen hundred dollar bow um you could i most 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 ranges will give you a setup ready to go for for hunting for around seven to eight hundred dollars it might not be brand new spanking top of the line uh it, it it varies archery archery equipment depreciates very fast in value so it's it's nothing to go pick up an older model bow say like a, a 2015 a 2016 bow that's been maybe used a little bit. If you, if you know what you're looking for, it's, it's, you got to watch some stuff, but I would, I would recommend going to a range. I wouldn't buy it secondhand on Kijiji. You don't know what you're getting. Um, I'd say around the startup, if it's a, if it's a used ish bow, relatively new, a couple of years old, I'd say you're looking around a thousand dollars ish roughly About for the most part. That's just a, that's a ballpark. You can find better deals than that, but it's, you know, in a nutshell, that that's going to vary a lot. But I would, I would go to a range and ask some local people what, Hey, was there a bow in here for me to try? That would be a good startup to bow if I'm looking for just an all around target bow and all around. Cause there's a thousand different models. They all vary there's right. from year to year. Like if you're a guy like me, you want to jump on the latest model all the time. I'm a sucker <laughs> for that. But uh, yeah, just uh, numbers wise, uh, if people are in that interested, they're writing this down 35 axle to axle, seven inch brace height. 50 pound limbs, 60 pound limbs. Don't go insane. That's a good all around number. Like 60 pounds is what, what 60 pounds is the limit for you're allowed to draw for a target setup. Okay. 60 pounds is lots for, for a hunting setup. Even 45, I think is the legal draw weight for hunting. So some, I, I got a 60 pound on mine and arrow always goes through. I'm only shooting deer though, not moose or anything like that. You got that 70 there. You could probably like hammer a moose with that thing pretty easy. Yeah. And if you're getting into hunting too, you got to be careful of what setup, what, what arrow, like what broadhead you're going to run. That's a huge, that's a whole, we could talk for three hours on broadhead selection. And a lot of guys on YouTube will say, this is the best. That's the best. It's, it's really personal. It's personal preference. A lot of stuff like for target archery, we're going to shoot a great big thick arrow. That's a line cutter for outdoor archery, something skinny. That's going to cut the wind. Same as if you were going to shoot again, if you're going to shoot your Two, two, three at 700, 800 yards, you're going to run a 90 grain bullet. That's long and going to cut the wind. A hunting arrow is a hunting arrow is going to be skinny and heavy, better penetration. It depends on the application, but all this bow I'm holding or my target bow will shoot every, every type of these, this sort of arrow. It's the same as a rifle. You can run different weights in, in different weights of, of ammunition through your, through your rifle and at different powder charges and you know, you can play around with those. So it's pretty, you know, most bulls will shoot any brand of arrow, depending on what type of shoot you want to go to, whether you mm -hmm. want to shoot target or hunting or that's not a, that's not a huge issue. And when you get into, if you get into competition shooting, I'm, I'm like, they would have requirements. Your bow has to meet these stats. Your arrows have to meet these stats. I assume yes. there's like limitations depending on the game you're shooting. Yes. 
Yeah. Like, um, so, so for, for, uh, you're only allowed to go five grains per pound for like, if you read a 3d shoot target arrows are you're going to run a heavy target arrow. So for 3d guys, a lot of the time like to run a faster setup, because if you're guessing the distance of the animal in front of you, the faster your bow is the, the, the less you can, the more you can get away with. If you're judging that distance, if I, if I, set my sights for 45 yards and the animals 55 yards, I'm going to hit very low, but the faster that is the less trajectory I'm going to have, right. The right. greater it's going to be. So, yeah. but you're only allowed five grains per pound. So you would, you, they're going to weigh your arrow. So, I mean, put your arrow on a scale. If you're setting up a, a lightweight arrow or a lighter weight arrow, um, you know, make sure you're so for every, if, if you have a 60 pound bow, you're allowed to run a 300 grain arrow. Right. So, or, or, and, and then I think the math on that's right. Anyway. <laughs> so, Yes. That's kind of, you have to know, you have to know the rules and, and regulations of that. Uh, there's different diameter arrows for different shooting for world archery is a 23 diameter arrow. Um, anything, any of the U S tournaments will allow you to shoot a 27 diameter arrow. Like the arrows I just showed, one of them was a 23, one of them was a 27 diameter arrow. That's just the thickness of the arrow. It, okay. I don't know if that applies in target shooting as much for, for pistol, the bigger the arrow, the more line cutters you're going to get inside right? Mm-hmm. Outdoors, you don't want a great big arrow because it's going to hit the wind and you're going to, you're going to be way all over the place. You want something long and heavy and skinny. And, yeah. Right. That's the kind of the same as a, as a rifle shooting, I would imagine. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Um, Adriel, you got any other questions for Christopher? Mm, no, not really. I mean, it was a, it was a good overall discussion. Yeah, I think so too. Um, we can yeah, get think, into some other things on it, like even just like those different heads as well and do that yeah. with, with hunting. I kind of actually want to do a whole. Let's do another hunting. one on hunting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we should. This is like, a, yeah. I'm excited about this. Yeah, I'm, dropping, I'm dropping a lot of information really fast. It's right, like, yeah. We can tell you're excited and you're showing off your toys and the information and you're right <laughs> yeah. into it. So that's awesome to see. It's hard to, it's hard to slow that down. And I don't know how long your podcasts normally run, but they're, there's other people that are much better at explaining things like this than I am. I, I'm more of a, here, I'll show you with like, let me set up my bow and show you. I'm, I'm a lot worse at explaining it, but oh, you're doing very well. No, you're doing great. Um, we do have a question from Kyle. Kyle wants to know if you would recommend a different axle to axle based on a person's height. Yeah, for sure. Um, if I'm six foot two, I've always had better luck shooting a longer bow because I have a pretty long jaw length. I shoot like, so the, the drawback of the bow is, is I shoot a 30, 30 and a half to 31 inch draw length. Um, if you're, if you're shorter, normally, if you're going to pick your draw length, you would do your wingspan divided by 2.5 is a ballpark to get you close. Um, yeah, if you're shorter in stature, don't be, don't, don't be shy to look into a bow. That's a 35 inch axle axle, or that's, that's pretty, that's still pretty forgiving for a target setup or even a hunting situation. If, if you start to get too long, a too long of a hunting bow, if you're trying to get a bow that will do that will, that's good for all disciplines for, for target and hunting and 3d and, and all things. Um, if you get, start to get too long of a bow, it's really hard to move that around a ground blind or a tree stand or carry up and down or get to the woods with you. Um, but yeah, uh, the, there's lots of target bows now that have shorter draw lengths are designed for like, well, there's lots of 36 inch, 34 inch draw length, uh, or axle axle bows for, for women and for younger shooters too. So okay. yeah, just go on, go on any of the bow sites, PSE, Matthews, Hoyt, Elite, they all have different sizes. Um, if you're a shorter person, uh, at six foot two and a 31 inch draw length, a uh, 40 inch axle axle bow works awesome for me. If you're five ten and you're running like a 28 inch draw length, you might not want that long of a bow. You might be more comfortable with, with a, with a shorter bow, but a uh, general rule of thumb, if you're going to shoot target archery, the longer the axle, the axle kind of, unless you're like a, uh, unless you're a new shooter, unless you're like a, a, a eight or 10 or 12, uh, the longer, the, the longer the bow, the more forgiving it's going to be. And for hunting the shorter, the bow, the faster and the more penetration you're going to get. So, and there's easier to fit into the blind, there. right? Easier to Why? get into the blind and, uh, and, and get your shot off. Cause like yeah. I always run into like height problems and a lot of blinds just I, trying to like fit my bow I, in there and get my shot. I'm, off. I missed the buck of a lifetime for that reason. It, it, I didn't get a shot. It, 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 my, my bow was too high. I was hitting the side of my ground blind. It was just, mm. it was just a nightmare. And that's when I went and bought a new hunting bow and I quit hunting. I used to hunt with my target <laughs> bow a lot of the time, trying to be cheap. I hunt with my target bow. So that was, it was an experiment gone wrong. It was, it was worth the $2,000. The next year I got my deer and, okay. uh, I didn't No no issues, no cams caught in the top of the ground blind. So, yeah, awesome. Yeah, cool for the awesome. job. 
Yeah. To answer the last question, um, really get a get a middle of the pack bow. I, I, if I were you, Kyle, I would I would shoot for like a uh, thirty five axle axle bow. That would be or a thirty four axle axle bow, thirty six. That would be ideal for hunting, three D archery, target archery. This would be a good all around number. I would okay. just something to shoot for. We had a couple of people ask if you ever did a Robin Hood. Were if you- I ever did a Robin Hood? Yeah. Yes. Uh, not very often if I can help it because uh, it's really expensive. How much How much are the arrows? Like, seriously, yeah. they so, must be expensive too. So we, we design arrows a lot of the time. Target archers will use an arrow design not to Robin Hood because this, what I'm holding with all set up and dressed, this is a $60 arrow. So I don't want to break that. I'm kind of cheap. So I can, this knock will pop off. And if I can get it off, you see, there's a pin right there on the end of that. Mm. Let's see. Okay. Yep. Okay. See the pin. Yeah. Yep. So yep. if another arrow hits that, it's going to hit that pin. It's not going to bust the back of the carbon of the arrow. And it has a collar on there, that little brass collar. Yep. You can see that protects it from another arrow going inside of another arrow. And it, that's, we kind of, we kind of set them up in target archery when they're trying to at outdoor archery, you're shooting six arrows at a time into the same target. 3d archery you're shooting, you're on groups of four up to three or four. So you're all shooting at that same little 10 ring and there's, everybody's trying to drive arrows. You alternate turns. The guy that goes first, the first time would go second, the next time. And then fourth guy would go second. And then they keep alternating. Um, so, and, and indoors you shoot three spot individual targets because inside you can't wad three arrows into a ball like that. You, 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 you go broke trying to shoot. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but yes, I, I have Robin Hooded arrows. Um, and and you usually as soon as I Robin Hood an arrow, I kind of cry a little bit because I just lost fifty bucks. And, and you, that's when you spend another twenty or thirty dollars and put pins in the back of your arrows. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but, in other words, it's not all that great of a thing. It's not. It's cool. I mean, it's cool, cool the first time, one. right? It's, it's normally normally in a 3D shoot is if you Robin Hood someone else's arrow and it's no good, they'll let you keep it, and then you hang that on your wall and you tease them about it for the next tournament. And that's normally if that's you're going to Robin Hood nice. an arrow, don't make it your own. Make it someone else's. So, <laughs> all right. Money, I hope. You know. That's, <laughs> that's a great great way to end. Uh, <laughs> I have nothing other there's no other comments or anything but um yeah is there anything that you want to talk about that we didn't cover um you want to pitch yeah sponsors gear i i I wish i had sponsors uh i mean i give a i'll give a big shout out to to brian at the atlantic archery center and here in fredericton uh he's he's been super with me with equipment since i was eight years old i bought all of my bows from him uh anybody in atlantic canada that's wanting to get into archery Give Brian at Atlantic Archery and Paintball Center a call, or if you're into paintball guns, he sells paintball guns too. <laughs> so, um, I I would uh, yeah, he's been super to me with all my equipment. That's where I get it. Um, I don't he 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 uses me very well as far as as far as calling uh, the PSE company and saying hey, I would like my new bow tomorrow. I've I've never gotten that. I've never gotten to that level of archery, but uh, um, I would say. I would say for anybody just looking to get into archery, just, just don't be shy. Just go do it. It's a very friendly sport. Um, everybody, 99% of the people in archery are, are going to want to help you and want you to get into it and, and try to grow their sport versus, versus, uh, you know, Hey, no, like I'm, I'm not interested. I just want to be here to shoot my bow. Most people will hang their bow up on the rack to get you interested in archery. Um, I've been to countless shoots where I've seen guys bows explode and, uh, everybody, you know, the, the guys on the target with that person will, they'll all pitch in and everybody's trying to help you get a, a bow set back up. Even though it's competitive, I want to know that if I win, I beat yeah. you at your best and I was at my best if I beat you or that you were at your best if you beat me. I don't want to beat you because your bow blew up. I want to beat you because you were on top yeah. of your game or I was on top of my game, right? Yeah. That's that's a, that's a, everybody in archery is pretty much like that. And that's kind of why I really fell in love with the sport mm-hmm. for, yeah. for competitive target archery. And I would I would say just don't shy out of it. Go go try it, and you'll you'll probably really love it. It's going to cost you some money if you fall in love with it, but that's any sport. Hey, <laughs> it is. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. 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 So and but with this, you get to pull your arrows. You you don't have to reload it. You can go pull them back out. So that's awesome. That's, that's a big Great. deal too. Yeah, <laughs> you can reuse them. Uh, yeah. Okay, so Trevor did not come on, and you like to actually rib him a little bit. Is there anything you want to say to him because he is going to listen to this? To Trevor. Yeah, good embarrassing Suck it up, you pansy. I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say to Trevor. Nice. <laughs> no, awesome. I, 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 again, I, I really owe all my archery success to Trevor, to be honest. So, uh, so I hope you're feeling better, man. Um, he's up in the, he's up in the 
the high risk COVID area. So hopefully he's okay. <laughs> and he's old. And he is old. <laughs> yeah. He is old. He looks Thanks, like Robert. a biker on your slam fire on your slam fire picture. I know. Eh? He couldn't. That's why. That's why he likes guns. He couldn't have that beard in archery. He would get caught in his string. <laughs> that's why he get into guns maybe i don't know <laughs> his beard meant that much to him maybe explains that bald spot he had that one time yeah. he's always had a bald spot since i was eight <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> poor guy it's grown this way <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right well thanks so awesome. much for coming on you're welcome uh, thanks for Chris. having me i appreciate it yeah yeah say, it. say hi to your dad for me i will i will thanks right. guys okay right, take thanks. Care. thanks have a good night nice you you have a good night once again, thanks to Christopher for coming on and being, li listen, truly one of the best interviews. Like, who would have thought that archery on a gun podcast would be? But it was awesome. I loved having him on. It was They're great. just guns that shoot knives. That's a They're very quiet guns. Yeah, long pointy things. Assassin <laughs> guns. <laughs> yes. All right. Anyways. But it was great to have him on. And as a gun, we keep saying it's like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. No, Trevor Bacon. Trevor Bacon. Mm, Trevor Bacon. 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 See, I'm no longer a politarian. I want bacon. Okay. Uh, let's get into listener feedback. Listener feedback is sponsored by Armory DC Gunsmith. Armory DC Gunsmith is a full service gunsmith who specializes in firearms refinishing. He offers hot bluing, parkerizing, Cerco finishes, as well as wood and steel refinishing. Check them out. Out his online inventory of new used guns, firearms, accessories, optics, and more at dcgunsmith.ca. And you can also follow him on the Instagrams as well as on Facebook as well. And guess what? We had no we had no Facebook. Well, we've been talking on Facebook as we go. Mm -hmm. We have no emails and no Patreons. We have no Instagrams. And we have no Facebook reviews. That was a quick section. That's it, really. <laughs> <laughs> oh hmm. yeah so anyways well, thanks for coming out everybody <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh we are looking for those emails for next week though so send us this, uh, an email at slamfireradio at gmail.com uh patreon supporters no news patreon supporters but if you'd like to support the show uh by the way adriel is paying our bills this month so thank you this allows us to pay our bills so that we can continue uh, doing the podcast. Anyways, go over to uh, patreon.com, uh, check out Slamfire Radio, and if you'd like to make a donation, we'd love to have you on board. We'll send you out some nice swag as well, or okay swag. Anyways. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. Very okay. Nice up, nice up, <laughs> so, Kelly. <laughs> we'll send you a bag of crap. <laughs> Whatever. Maybe we should re revisit that. Anyways, <laughs> shout outs. What do you got, Dave? Uh, thanks to everybody who listened tonight. And thanks for to Christopher for coming on and being a yeah. huge archery nerd. That was just fantastic. Yeah. I like how excited he got about it. I know. Amazing. Yeah. Adriel, what do you got? Uh, yeah, just all the guys at 3Gun uh, helping to put the hours in and construct like wicked props. We did some work on our helicopter. We did some work on oh, like cool. all sorts of cool stuff that people in other clubs uh, aren't even aware you can do. And I know that when a lot of clubs look at the the stellar matches we do, they're uh, they could can't even imagine, can't even imagine all the cool stuff we got. <laughs> and it's all because people volunteer their time and yeah, they go work and and they're decent at carpentry and not like me. I'm a I'm a paper pusher and yeah, you're pretty those good guys with the Dremel. Out. Let's be real. Yeah. I a do skill. a lot with That's it. I don't skill. know if I'm good at it, but I do a lot with it. And those magazines that are coming in the mail will not survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do have a shout out. I just wanted to say thank you to actually Adriel. Adriel and I have been chatting late into the evening, um, past couple of nights as well. So I wanted to say thank you for all the work that you've been doing with getting uh, Maple Seed up and running Aww. and also on the show. And then I also wanted to say thank you to Lewis, who's Christopher's dad, for arranging us to have him on tonight. And then also to Christopher. He was a fantastic, uh, he was a really fantastic interview. But not only that, I love the way he was talking. It reminds me of home. <laughs> it was East Coastern. East Coastern? East Coast. East Coastern? East Coast. Anyways. Yeah. Just reminds me. Yeah. It just reminds me of home. Anyways, so uh, yes, Dave. 
note on that, Kelly, since there's no good uh, no good archery programs out there, I'm thinking arrow seed. Oh, jeez. That's just what we need. Something on top of that. Hey, something else to do. Yeah, no. I, no, I'm not an archer. And I don't do archery. So maybe we can find somebody else. Trevor. Trevor. Adriel. And I shoot it. Christopher. I, I shoot a deer every once in a while. That's yeah. all I do. Okay. Yeah. But you hit them. So well, sometimes. Mm. 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 All right. Maybe we should talk about transferable skills. Mm. We got to have him on again. I want to talk to him about arrows. I want to talk to him yeah. about tips, but I want to talk about transferable skills from shooting to archery because there is those too. Okay. Uh, check out Gunners Canada. Go like us on Facebook. Give us a read on Facebook as well. Join the CCFR. Go and donate to them. And don't forget to actually send us an email with the picture so that we can put you in that draw. And guess what, everybody? We'll see you next week. Happy 400. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. So if you have any comments or questions for the show, please send an email to slamfireradio at gmail.com. Now go grab a gun and shoot something. When the talking is over, it's time to get a gun.